Okay. Right. Looks like we're I on. think we're on. I think we're on. Well, good day, everybody. We are here on the Duran, and we are incredibly privileged to have Dima from the Military Summary Channel that uh, I think a lot of you have been following. This is, in my opinion, it's not just my opinion, the opinion of many, many people, the best channel for keeping up to date with the military situation in Ukraine. Now, before I proceed, um, I would just like to explain one thing very quickly, which is that, of course, Alex Christophe would have been with us, but he can't be, unfortunately, because um, YouTube, in its wisdom or, well, whatever, for, for, for whatever reason, has decided to ban him for a week because of something that he said, medical information that he allegedly provided a year and a half ago on a program on YouTube. So unfortunately, he's not able to be with us in person. He, you can't you, he can't participate in our program, but he remains fully active and absolutely engaged with the Duran, with our programs. And you can find his programs on Rumble, on Locals, on Odyssey, on all our various pl pro platforms. I would specifically urge you to track them down on Locals and also on Telegram, which is uh, where we're a growing presence. And of course, he remains active. He's still publishing there. So um, with more with, with, with more ado, I think let's now proceed with Dima. Well, first of all, Dima, can I uh, thank you for joining us today here on the Duran? It's a great honor and a great privilege for us that you have uh, joined us. Uh, can you just tell everybody where we can find you? Tell us where your channel is, the name of your channel, so that people can link to it. And we'll be providing a link to your channel at the um, um, at the bottom of this video when it's, when it's done. Uh, hi, everyone. Hi, Alexander. Hi, Gonzalo. Uh, it's a very big pleasure and very big uh, event in my life that I I uh, joined your Did You Run channel. It's, uh, I'm a very big fan of your channel, of your art, we can say. Uh, my channel is Military Summary Channel. Uh, you can find, if you uh, want to understand, want to see the current situation on the ground in Ukraine uh, with the progress of armies, of, Russian for, of the Russians or uh, of the Ukrainians, uh, you can follow my channel and there you are, will be able to understand the current situation and there we will be, you will be able to see the things that you won't be able to see in any West media. Or uh, if you are able to see them, maybe they will be a little bit censored by the West media. So this is about the channel. Yeah, can, can, can I just add a few things? One of the great things about Dima's channel, about the military summary channel, is the extraordinary skill with which uh, um, it uses maps. And it uses maps from different sources. So you have the Russian sources map, you have the Western sources map, you have uh, uh, maps that he's, uh, which Dima Military Summary Channel is able to show you exactly what the layout of the various forces are. Now, if you just read accounts of the war, or if you hear what people just say and with visual images of the fighting, that doesn't always give you an impression of how things relate to each other. And that's, I think, the single greatest quality of the work that the military, uh, um, military Summary Channel and DEMA do. So if you, if you learn that there's fighting going on in Siversk, you learn how this relates to fighting in places like Bakhmut, for example. I mean, I'm just plucking names out of the battlefields. Now, for those of us, like myself, who are utter civilians, who have no experience of war or fighting, who have difficulty understanding maps, who, who don't understand these things. This is, I think, an absolutely invaluable education. It really helps you to understand the course of the war. And I should say that Dima somehow manages to provide us with updates every day. And this is a wonderful service that he provides is the finest service that any military uh, uh, commentator, any commentator, the military side of things provides about this uh, war. So without further ado, uh, Dima, if I could just ask you a few questions, of course, Gonzalo is going to I'm sure have other things to say as well. Uh, you're, you're, you're up against two people who 
talk lots, but can I just be briefly ask, um, how do you think see things are going? It looks to me as if we're now approaching the end of the Battle of Donbass. Is this also your general feeling, or do you think that the Ukrainians still might have some uh, things that they can do, some cards still to play? Uh, yes, we are at the final chapter of the Donbas arc operation. This is uh, this battle for Donbas, the battle for Slovensk, Kramatorsk, uh, Konstantinovka, Bakhmut, Siversk, uh, Avdeevka, the battle for these towns. Uh, the Russian called this uh, operation the, the Donbas arc operation. And we are uh, right in front of the final chapter of this battle. If we are talking about the Ukrainians, uh, if you ask me, uh, if they are able to do something, yes, they are able. The only thing they can do uh, uh, on this front line is just to fix the Russians as long as possible. Mm -hmm. uh, we heard, everybody heard that uh, these days, those days, the Ukrainians announced that they're planning to start some offensive operation, counter-offensive operation on the south. Uh, if we're talking about the south, we are talking about Kherson and Zaporozhye. Mm -hmm. So that's why uh, they need to fix the Russians uh, on on Donbas arc operation in Donbas, and if it possible to force the Russians to move uh, some forces towards the south of Ukraine. Mm -hmm. So I think that yes, the Ukrainians they are doing this right now. They mm -hmm. try to uh, on if we are talking about uh, Donbas, they are trying to fix the Russians there. And if we're talking about the south, I think that in a week, in a month, we are going to see something very big and something mm -hmm. very. Uh, undescribable, if I can say it. Yeah, there's something I don't understand uh, though about this. Can I just just quickly question, and then and then Gonzalo, it's over to you. Which is, I don't understand why the Ukrainians would announce an offensive weeks in advance. I'm surely that's going to alert the Russians to what they're going to do, and you know, give the Russians time to prepare for it. I mean, if 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 it's going to come, I mean, it seems. I'm talking now again as a non-military person. I mean, is there any reason or logic why they would do that? Because they've been talking about this great offensive in the South for weeks now. But is this is this uh, is is there something here I don't get or I'm not understanding? Uh, if we're talking about the South uh, offensive operation in Ukraine, we need to understand the Ukrainian aims in this area. Of course, there are a lot of projections, a lot of options, a lot of opinions about the offensive operation. Some people say that the Ukrainians are planning to return Kherson, Zaporozhye. Uh, and I, I, to tell the truth, I haven't heard any other option from any military expert. But if you ask me, I must say that the Ukrainians are not planning to, at least, uh, it's not, not like their main goal. It will be like a bonus if they are able to return Kherson, Zaporozhye. Uh, you know that uh, some military authorities from Ukraine announced that the main idea, the main goal of Ukrainians is not to return territory. It's Yes, it's to return, but uh, before that, uh, they want to deal as much as possible, de possible damage to the Russians, so to force them to stop. So for now, and this is, uh, you are talking about the South operation, the Ukrainians are planning to deal as much damage as possible. Mm -hmm. And if they are able to return some territories, during this damage. Of course, uh, it will be like a bonus. They don't care. It's my opinion. I'm not saying that it's some kind of information you are able to find anywhere else. I analyzed the situation for a very long time. I understand that uh, the Ukrainians are not counting their losses, their, their manpower, their material losses. If if there is a situation, if, if they are able, for example, to uh, destroy, let's say, 50,000 of the Russians, and meanwhile mm. to lose like 200 of their soldiers, it's okay for them because mm. these 50,000 thousand is a very big loss for the Russians. And uh, with these losses, they won't be able to um, continue very fast. They will need, they will have to spend some time for regrouping, for some, mm. uh, for adopting some laws and so on. And the time in this situation is the best thing for the Ukrainians because everybody understands that soon we are going to uh, enter after Donbass arc operation, after a counter-offensive operation in the south, we're going to enter the autumn and winter campaign. And as I see nobody, at least um, for now, I can't say what kind of disaster this is going to be, the winter campaign. What um, 
uh, do parties are planning to do during this campaign. Mm. Now, I understand that there would be no you know, aggressive offensive operation from any side, but before wins a campaign, uh, everybody need to do something. If you're talking about the Ukrainians, they need to fix the Russians and not to allow them, for example, to encircle mm. uh, Kharkov or uh, to encircle Nikolaev or to encircle mm. Zaporozhye. Uh, so this is the reason, just to deal as much as possible damage to, uh, to the Russians. Mm. Alexander. So, um, so this would mean, hey, Dima, it's great to see you and uh, great to talk to you. And Alexander, as always, it's it's a pleasure being on and chat. Thanks for uh, having me on again. And I'll be sure to mute myself whenever I'm not talking, so it doesn't doesn't bother you guys again. Anyway, uh, the point I wanted to make, Dima, is you you say that the Russians, excuse me, that the Ukrainians are willing to lose two hundred thousand soldiers if they inflict fifty thousand casualties on the Russians. But the Ukraine armed force is a limited amount. In total, the total number pre-war, as I understand it, was 600,000. But that included police, border guards, everybody. Their actual army, as I understand it, before the war started was 250,000. And from the current best estimates that are very conservative, they're saying that the Ukrainians have lost outright, I mean, killed in action. Uh, something like 50,000 soldiers. The, the um, estimates are between 40 and 50,000 uh, killed and an additional 25 to 35,000 who are wounded and won't be, uh, won't be combat effective anymore. And so how many soldiers can the Ukrainians lose before they simply collapse? Uh, uh, an army can't withstand those losses indefinitely. I mean, you know, you run out of soldiers is my point. Uh, from my perspective, it's not a question about the uh, soldiers, it's the question about the territories. Uh, the Ukrainians uh, are going to collapse only on the west bank uh, of the Dnieper River. Before that, they will have endless support with volunteers, not maybe endless, but there would be volunteers all over the world. They have, we, we know that uh, we can see already females on the front lines. Uh, mm -hmm. We see males on the front line. Uh, they uh, can bring uh, everybody who reach 18 years till 60 years. Mm -hmm. So that's mm -hmm. a lot. And the population of Ukraine mm -hmm. is around 40 millions. So yeah. uh, one million, if we are talking about their army, a number of one million, it's nothing. It's nothing uh, in comparison with 40 millions. So everybody in Ukraine can yeah. hold the weapon. Everybody in Ukraine can yeah. run the trucks. Yeah, but, but those we... people will be killed immediately. I mean, you, you can't have people who are civilians today mm -hmm. pick up a weapon and tomorrow be fighting professional, hardened, battle-hardened Russian soldiers. It seems crazy. It seems suicidal, quite frankly. If we're talking about the structure of the Ukrainian army, I see that they have, uh, it's like very softly, they have two, uh, two groups, professional army and unprofessional army. Mm. And both these groups uh, have their own targets, their own goals and so on. If we're talking about the professional army, mm. the Ukrainian military authorities uh, want to keep, to hold the professional army as long as possible. And if we're talking mm. about unprofessional, their main goal to uh, be a wall between professional army and the Russians. So they will be like between them. And meanwhile, the Russians trying mm. to reduce the unprofessional army, those defend army, there's females, there's mm. old guys and so police and so on. The professional one will do some sabotage, commandos, uh, some hammers, mm. impacts and so on. And as you see, uh, during this week, we had a lot of successful hammers attacks uh, on the territory that is under the Russian control. Yesterday, there was a very a big explosion. According to the Ukrainian sources, they destroyed some warehouse. According to the Russian sources, they destroyed some civilian building, and there were a lot of losses um, even among the children. Uh, the day before, there was the same uh, impact of hammers mm. uh, around Shakhtarsk, the town in the DPR Republic. Mm. So we see, we see that uh, something changes in this uh, conflict, in this game. So we'll see, of course. I mean, I have to say, though, I mean, what, what you're talking about is a humanitarian catastrophe because, of course, bloodletting on this scale is something we've never seen before um, in Europe, at least not going back. You have to go back to the Second World War. And um, I do wonder to what extent it's worth it. I mean, what ultimately does Ukraine 
expect to achieve? Do they think that they can win win this war, that they can regain their lost territories this way? Or is it somehow a negotiation? What, what do you think they're... I mean, do you have any idea what their grand strategy is? I mean, I understand it's to slow the Russians down, but what is the ultimate objective? Do they have one? Are they improvising? Of course, of course. They have like a few stages, like few steps. Uh, like we can say that mm. the best the best scenario for them, the Ukrainians want to not just win, they want to ruin the Russian Federation. It's like the mm. best uh, dreams in their life, of course. Yeah. It's the best uh, option for them. The second one to regain the territory. Uh, next, just to return on the level of the 24th of February. And of course, the worst scenario for Ukraine, not the worst, not before the worst scenario is yeah. to uh, to save Ukraine as entity. And the worst of them is to be captured and to be involved in the uh, as the yeah. member of Russian Federation. So and yeah. every, and for now, as I see, if we're talking about the Ukrainian situation. Um, now the Ukrainians are fighting for uh, the third option, like to um, to force to move the Russians on the border of the 24th of February. So now, now they're planning at least to achieve this one. And um, but I'm not uh, sure I, that the, 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 the issue, the, the question I have is, of course, you can plan to push the Russians back, but over the last I don't know eight weeks. Since, since um, the, the withdrawal from Kiev and the other cities and the real buckling down the Donbass, every single day the Russians have been gaining ground, moving forward incrementally, step by step. When exactly is the moment when the Ukrainian armed forces would be able to stop this relentless Russian advance? Because at this time it seems that there's no stopping it. In fact, it seems to be increasing. The, the Russian pace seems to be increasing. I just have to add a horrible bit of news that I, that I learned that apparently it is official that yesterday the Ukrainian armed forces lost officially 500 soldiers. I mean, at the, and this is the official number. At this pace, you know, no army can withstand this. It seems suicidal to me, to tell you the truth. And so mm. my question is, at what point would it be possible for the U Ukraine armed forces to stop this relentless Russian advance? Mm. Uh, the question is very interesting. Uh, the thing is that uh, it's they're they're not able to do this ever. Uh, first of all, we know that the Russian uses just uh, we can say like twenty percent of their power. It's like the best uh, projection if the Russian the Russians uses twenty percent. But from the other side, we're talking about the Ukrainians. They don't use their full power as well. Uh, yes, they are losing in Donbas arc operation. They are losing Donbas. Uh, they are losing meter by meter every day, but they use their also maybe maybe 20% of their main power as well. The main Ukrainian forces located in on the south near Zaporozhye, near uh, Odessa, near Nikolaev, near Krivorokhy, mm. and so on. So we see that there is a battle of very limited forces on the ground, very limited forces from both sides. And if we're talking about the result of this battle between two limited armies, we see that the Russians are winning in this limited battle. But what is going to be when, uh, for example, the Russians will announce about some kind of mobilization, industrial mobilization after that, about the real mobilization, there'll be a totally different picture. Nobody knows what is going to be when, uh, as we discussed, every single person in Ukraine will, will get uh, some gun in his hands and will get receive an order mm. to go forward. Nobody knows. Um, do the Ukrainians have possibility to stop the Russians? Yes, they have. We had we had a lot of ex examples in the past. Uh, let's uh, just talk. Let's just remind about the Vietnamese campaign where the United States of America mm. had. Uh, around 60,000 of official losses they had during this conflict. And we're talking about the Vietnamese, they lost around 2 million. So uh, why don't we think that there might be the same scenario in Ukraine? Uh, do you think that the Russians are able to not are able? Do the, you think that the Russians mm -hmm. do really want to continue this offensive operation, this military special operation, if they understand that uh, during this war around 10 mm -hmm. millions of Ukrainians were killed? I don't think so. They they would want to do this because it's it's not mm -hmm. the war. It's something else. It's something else that we yeah. Have but already... uh, but I I understand. But you know the the issue is of course the the Vietnam War was a war between the United States, an invading power 
and uh, the Vietnamese who had thrown off the yoke of French colonialism and they just looked at the Americans as another um, possible colonial power trying to take them over. But here we have an issue where we have an enormous number of Ukrainians who are ethnic Russians and Vladimir Putin just uh, signed, as I believe yesterday, Alexander, you can confirm this, mm -hmm. a decree where he announced that every Ukrainian citizen can apply for a Russian passport. So uh, politically, it's a very, very different war than Vietnam. I understand mm -hmm. the, the, the point that you're making that, you know, a determined, uh, a small, poor, determined population can beat back and win against a greater power. Mm -hmm. But uh, in this situation, number one, a, a lot of the Ukrainians are ethnically Russian and are sympathetic to Russia. Number one. Number two, there are a lot of people in Ukraine who might not feel ethnically Ukrainian, but think that this war is crazy, that it cannot be won. And, and that, that, of course, affects morale. And uh, the, the third point that I'd like to make is that, see, um, I, how can I put it? The scale of the losses are, are just so astronomical. And the people of Ukraine uh, are not mm. used to endless wars like the Vietnamese war in the 70s and the 60s. So I, 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 I just find it a hard thing to believe that the Ukrainians will continue to mm. fight indefinitely and just shovel people into this meat grinder. I, I find it difficult to believe, to tell you the truth. Hmm. I, I, agree to, I totally agree with you. And we are living in the 21st century. There is TikTok, hmm. there is YouTube. People uh, can see everything. So that's why, of course, hmm. nobody is going to fight till the, at least Ukrainians are, I think that they're not planning to fight till the last Ukrainian, of course. So at some hmm. point, at some point, uh, I think that the situation uh, can yeah. collapse. Yeah. I mean, can I well, just make one? That's that's a question. Can, can I, Sorry, that, that's a that's a question I want to know. When will they collapse? Very interesting question. Very interesting question. Uh, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I'm not mm. sure that they will collapse after Donbas car operation, because they still have a lot of territories. They still have mm. Kharkiv. They still have Dnipro, mm. Zaporozhye, Nikolaev, yeah. Odessa. They still have a lot of uh, towns to fight for. Yeah. Maybe after some big town as Donetsk, maybe yeah. after Kharkiv, we're going to see some kind of collapse on the front line. Yeah. I mean, can I just make a quick observation about Vietnam, which is, of course, that it was also a civil war. And many of those two million who died were fighting on the American side. So, I mean, you know, it's 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 a complicated thing. What do you think the Russians are going to do after after Donbass falls? Uh, as I see after the Donbass arc operation, if the Ukrainians would be defeated on the south, it's very important. No, because if the Ukrainians are able to achieve some success on the south, I'm not sure. Uh, I, and about success, I mean to deal as much as possible damage to the Russians. Mm. Uh, in this case, they, of course, they will have to, they need some time for regrouping or for mobilization or any other procedures. Mm. And only the next summer, they will be able to continue. Mm. If the Ukrainians will be defeated, in this case, I think that uh, the Russians will try to do something with Kharkiv or mm. Zaporozhye, because if we're talking mm. about the territory, uh, the Russians has already um, around 30% of Kharkiv district region under control, and if we're talking about Zaporozhye, around 70 So we can say that maybe they would try to to take control over entire area and after that they will be able to make some referendum on these territories and maybe mm -hmm. to liberate them or to join to, mm -hmm. to take them as a part of russia mm, i see can i just uh, can i just ask a question again as a sort of complete non-military person why is it so difficult to keep fighting during the winter now i i say this because i mean during the second world war people did fight during the winter i mean the soviet union the, the Red Army conducted winter offensives. W what is it about the winter this time that would make it very difficult for soldiers, for armies to continue operating? Is it because equipment is different? Is it because the will isn't there? I mean, why, why would we expect the tempo of the war to reduce during the winter? You know that uh, if we're talking about this uh, situation, if we're talking about the Ukrainians, they achieved the best success near the towns and areas where the forest is. 
uh, they uh, get a lot of success near Kharkiv. If we're talking about the Izum Bridge, had the Russian call this the forest near this town, Sherwood Forest, like mm -hmm. uh, a fairy tale, right? And uh, it's um, the thing is that there are a lot of leaves and a lot of green color, so it's very easy to hide, to take positions. Uh, for example, if we're talking about the ground. It's very easy to build trenches if you're retreating yeah. and you need to establish new positions. So that uh, if you are talking about offensive part, you need always to, uh, to at least warm soldiers. Uh, to, you need to um, in, not like in. You need to fix your log logistic. You need to um, because winter uh, the weather is very bad. Sometimes it's minus. Furthermore, if we're talking about Ukraine, about the mm -hmm. south of Ukraine. Uh, there, uh, somewhere in January, in the end of December, in the January, there are always fox in this area. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it's very bad for the uh, def defense side, but we were talking about offensive one. Yes, it's very good if the if the January is uh, very warm. There are a lot of fog, and it's very nice to start some offensive operation. And mm -hmm. we saw something like this in 2014-15 when the Russians took control over Donetsk airport. Uh, the Russians mm -hmm. couldn't took this town for a very uh, this airport for a very long time, but in January the fog came on the area and so that's why they managed to cross those mm. fields which were under uh, crossfire from the Ukrainian side so there are a lot of things during the winter and uh, I think that it's my projection maybe they will find some solution how to solve the all the problems that winter come can bring but mm. I think that uh, on winter time nobody is going to do any um, like very mm. long uh, uh, distance offensive mm. operations because what you've just said, though, suggests that winter in this kind of world, part of the world, favours the attacker because the ground is hard, the foliage is thinner in the forests, and they can hide in the fog in the south. So this works. I, From what you say, it seems to work in favour of the Russians. And, of course, the Russians have the bigger industrial base, much bigger industrial base. They have the, 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 they have the experience of presumably fighting in winter. I mean, one, anyway, I'm just, I'm just throwing this question. I mean, why, but, why would the Russians stop in winter? Let's, remain, uh, let's uh, remember the February. Yeah. If you remember the February, right, mm. this February, we understand that uh, the biggest losses was during the February during the winter period of time yeah and for many reasons uh, the russians didn't use the ground to do some broad frontline attacks with their heavy equipment they tried to use the roads and uh, that that make them we can say accumulate forces to the same place a lot of problems were during the winter and as soon as uh, spring comes if to be more precise after the 16th of april uh, the Russians managed to took town by the name of Izum somewhere at the beginning yeah. of April, and after that day, uh, as soon as uh, after 16 of April, they started everything we can see right now. When yeah. the weather is fine, when like uh, the sky is fine, so it's like we, uh, I can I do my projection according to the facts we have seen uh, Same, during yeah. the first phase okay. of this company. I see. I understand. Tell us about the command systems here, because this is the other thing I completely don't understand. I mean, we're getting a lot of confusing information from the British, especially about this. I mean, do you think that there is an overall Russian commander in charge of all the Russian forces in Ukraine? Or is it just individual commanders operating in different fronts? I mean, do you think they have a general in charge in Donbass, one in Kharkov, one in Zaporozhye, one in Kherson, um, all of them doing their own thing? Or do you think they're all operating according to some sort of single plan with a single person in overall command? Sorry for that. Uh, I th I think that uh, of course the Russian commands uh, commanders is centralized. Mm -hmm. uh, they are centralized, and uh, uh, of course uh, they have some uh, they, they they use uh, some um, kind of structure using BTG. You know that doesn't better better than tactical Italian group group. Yes, yeah. yes. Every um, if we are talking about the beginning of this special military operation, as far as I know, uh, there was like four front lines. The one uh, in Kiev, another one Chernigov, another one Kharkiv, and another one on the south, Kherson. Uh, mm. And mm. all these front lines were under four separate commanders. Uh, 
Yeah. And uh, they, they, it's information I have. I can't. Maybe it's some kind of speculation, but the thing that I managed to find, uh, like in articles and some uh, thing that people were dis were discussing the situation. So, mm -hmm. and all those four commanders, they wasn't like coordinating between each other. And mm -hmm. we now we see and we saw the result of this uh, non coordination between the armies. And somewhere in April, they managed to uh, to put one. A commander above all the front lines and mm. after that we see the progress and I, i'm sure that there is a very nice coordination between the parties between the front lines as i see uh they um they're as i see they're not attacking at the same time on every single front line no. they try to change the front lines first they uh, start some offensive operation near Liman. then they move their forces toward papasna after papasna yeah. they concentrated forces uh near um, uh, Tatyanovka and Svetogorska Lavra, then they move toward Toshkovka and Severodonetsk. Mm -hmm. so their coordinates and they give their forces to uh, rest for a while, for like one week, uh, like two weeks in offensive, mm -hmm. then two weeks some, uh, to keep forces, to mm -hmm. give them regroup, uh, fulfill and to rest. If you're talking about the Ukrainians, uh, they are also, of course, under um, control of West instructions, uh, instructors, mm -hmm. We can mm. say, yes, they have uh, their own commander, main chief, Zaluzhny. But mm. I see that uh, if, we're to, if we can compare the Russian military structure and the Ukrainian military structure, I see that uh, if we're talking about the media, I see that Zaluzhny very depends on Zelensky decision. And the mm. previous period of war says that this dependence cause a lot a lot of problems to the ukrainians army maybe just rumors but uh, mm. we uh, discussed yeah. the situation many times when zaluzhny asked permission from Zel zelensky to retreat from severodonetsk and they retreated but uh, the russians showed the picture that they left a lot of vehicles a lot of tanks a lot of equipment mm. so that means that they uh, retreat from severodonetsk uh, and lisichansk very late uh, and if we're talking about the Russians, I don't see any political decision in their um, offensive mm. operation. They try to save people, they try to save soldiers, they try to save materials. And sometimes I see that um, their commander, um, maybe he uh, gets some advices and some, um, mm. some talks with Putin, but mm. I think that he make his own decision how to do this uh, military special operation in the best way. Mm. Now, yesterday, I got an extremely interesting email from someone. I'm not, I, I'm not going to disclose this person, but he's, he um, is an Indian Army officer. And he suggested that the high Mars systems that we are seeing operating, that the uh, missiles, uh, that, the, that the actual targeting of the missiles is um, largely the work of the U.S. In other words, that the U.S. Um, has control over the way these systems are used. These are, these, this is the very long range missiles that we're probably going to start to see increasingly being used. I mean, we've had the 70 kilometer ones. Now we're going to see perhaps the 300 kilometer ones coming, um, but that it's actually the US itself, which is coordinating and controlling this. Do you think this is probably true or do you think that the US will allow the Ukrainians to play a role? Uh, anyway, anyway, uh, we need to understand that uh, mm. for the U.S. is mm, not a problem that Ukrainians are able to use them by themselves. For the U.S. is the problem that these vehicles can be sold to the Russians. Mm. There was a lot of examples during this uh, special operation when the West um, uh, West uh, sources West uh, weapon. Um, the Ukrainians, some soldiers, sold this weapon to the Russians, and there was a lot of articles. Of course, I can't tell you that it is true, but uh, yeah. there was a lot of information about that. And believe me, I'm sure that uh, there is something like this. So that's why I'm sure that um, if we're talking about this uh, HIMARS system, I'm sure that the U.S. will try to uh, to control this equipment mm. just one reason not to allow anybody to sell this equipment to the Russians and not mm. to allow this equipment mm. to get into Russian Russians' hands. So that's mm. why they will control. If they do some uh, advices how to use this, 
there was a lot of instructions. There is instru there are instructor instructors who controls who teach Ukrainians. So maybe during these instructions, during these teachings, they show the Ukrainians how to use and mm. where to use. So probably yes. I mean, I mean, I would say that that has some rather disturbing implications because if the unite the U.S. is involved in actual targeting then despite its denials it is a participant in the war it's it's actually it's military are actually making military decisions not just you know gen providing advice but they're actually involved directly in the launching of missiles which strike at russian targets and and kill people so that does have political implications and one wonders whether in fact um, you know what? What? What consequences we consequences we would see? But that's a political a political topic. I don't know whether you, um, either you or Gonzalo have anything you want to say about that. And Dima, Gonzalo, do you want to comment on that briefly? Yeah, my my thinking is that um, if it turns out mm -hmm. that the Americans themselves are targeting HIMARS and any mm -hmm. of it hits Russian territory, then the Russians could justifiably say this is war by the United mm -hmm. States against Russia. Uh, mm -hmm. I mean, you can't really look at it any other way. Uh, mm -hmm. you, yeah, sure, the HIMARS are in, in the possession of the Ukrainian armed forces, but the ones who aimed for and fired mm -hmm. on Russian territory are Americans. I mean, it, it seems pretty clear cut. It, it seems that these HIMARS, number one, people might be paying too much attention to them because as, as a number of weapons systems that exist, I do understand we're talking about eight such missile launchers, which is a trivial number for the size of this, um, of this war, of this conflict uh, on the one hand. And, and I think it's just this week's iteration of the wonder weapon that will change the tide of the war. Just like the week before it was the M777 and the week before that it was the Turkish drone, the, um, I forget the name of it. Barak, but, the Barak. Yeah, Barak. Yeah, Barak. Yeah, I, I think it's, it's just, um, I, I think it is a potential political complication, but at the same time, in the scheme of things, it's so trivial. Unless it were to actually hit, I don't know, um, Kursk and hit like a school in Kursk, okay, mm -hmm. then that's a totally different story. But, it, it, you know, these weapons are getting chewed up before they even get deployed. So I don't know if we have to really worry about it. What about the Crimean Bridge? Anyway, anyway any thoughts about this, Dima? What are your views about the high mass? Uh, I must say that if we're talking about the Russians and uh, about their, uh, you can say, um, segment of their internet, um, I can say that they're afraid of this system, but they pointed on this system. So they like start, mm. start talking, start rumoring, start like uh, discuss the situation. They're not afraid, but they're a little bit stressed with this. Uh, for, uh, for many reasons, and because uh, as I as I see most of the population in Russia and people who follow the situation, they don't understand what kind of impact, real impact, this system can do. Because um, uh, during the previous century, there wasn't, there were, uh, there weren't even a case. wasn't a case when this system were used against the Russians. So that's why they don't know what's go what what to expect, what to yeah. expect. What to do with this? Maybe yeah. uh, th there was a uh, few um, attacks on the warehouses. There was attack, uh, yeah. and th those attacks was very successful. So for now, they don't understand what to do with this and how to react on this. Too afraid or not? Mm. They don't know. I, I, I'm going to make one observation about this: the high mass, which uh, I, neither of you perhaps are aware of, but which I found in the Financial Times which is that the United States has apparently provided Ukraine with a third of its entire arsenal of missiles and rockets for the high mass systems. So that suggests to me that we're going to get firstly an awful lot more of them. And we're talking about something like 8,000 missiles and rockets in, to in total, which perhaps doesn't sound like a huge number if we're talking about a multiple rocket launch system, at least to me. But it seems to me that it's something of a hybrid in that it's both a multiple rocket launch system in some applications and a fairly long range missile system in others. Any thoughts about this, um, Adima? I must say that uh, 
the during this week uh, the Ukrainians started using HIMARS mm. and this their attack their attacks was very accurate yeah. so they reached the target yeah. and for the rockets is the most important to yeah. reach the target and if you say that uh, the U the US provided 6000 rockets that means that there is six target potential targets that these rockets yeah. will reach and that's yeah. a lot that's yeah. 6,000 warehouses, that's 6,000 headquarter bases or something yeah. like this. So that's a lot. And of yeah. course, uh, nobody, and if we're talking about the Russians, they shouldn't like say, ah, it's nothing. No, they shouldn't. Yeah. They should be aware of this. They need to concentrate on searching these rockets, these Heimers, and they need to destroy them as soon as they found them, yeah. no matter the price and the cost they're going to pay for this. Yeah. They don't know how to react uh, on this, and they shouldn't even find out about this. They should destroy it exactly as they see them. Yeah. As I understand it, they've already started destroying a number of them, and that's why the Americans had to ship more. I, offhand, excuse me. Offhand, I don't know how many they have destroyed so far, but they have destroyed several. Some, some sources are saying that they managed to destroy two of them. Yeah. yeah. Just two, so, but it's... Out of, out of eight... Right, out of eight, out of yes. eight that have been out, that have that have been that have been sent to Ukraine, but they have not yet been deployed. All eight, and I do understand that the Americans promised an additional four after those first two were destroyed. So, I, I, I mean, it, it's certainly uh, look. I'm not saying that these weapons are not to be uh, uh, are to be ignored or forgotten about, but I mm. don't think it's. I don't see this as a game changer. I, I, that, that's the thing that mm. I am. Mm. Uh, that I'm a little bit tired of in the West that they keep saying that the next weapon system is the game changer that this yeah. wonder weapon will turn the tide and win the war and no single weapon system has ever won a war it's always a combination it's mm -hmm. always soldiers artillery air power tanks all of it put together it's not just one thing I mean that that's the thing that I want to emphasize furthermore if we're talking about the Russians today we got the day that Iran is uh, planning mm -hmm. to uh, provide the Russians hundreds of their drones. So, and I think that these two things correlate because the Russians, their drone system is not so effective as the West mm -hmm. one. So that's why uh, these these Iran uh, drones, which were built on the basis of the US drones. So mm -hmm. I think that this might be a game changer because of high, uh, high number of yeah. this system. And of course, with these systems, the Russians will be able to strike the Ukrainians and those high mm -hmm. anywhere on the front line. Yeah, I, I was actually going to ask you directly about this business of the Iranian drones, because that in, is, in a way is an extraordinary story. But um, it, it, it does make a kind of sense, because as I understand it, uh, the Russians were very, very slow to adopt drone warfare. And though they've now started making their own drones, it's taken them a very long time to do so. And they've only got relatively few of them. Is this correct, uh, Dima? I can't tell you this because the Russians use some system like Arlan Desit uh, and uh, yeah. Chinese, some Chinese drones. They use some system, but uh, to tell the truth, there was even some videos from the Ministry of Defense of using of these drones but I can say that um, there yeah. was some kind of woe effect that we seen uh, from as effect from Bayraktar in the beginning of this military special operation. Remember when uh, in the February and March people were saying that Bayraktar won this war because whoa, Bayraktar, so many videos, so on. And we're talking about the Russian drones. We didn't get such uh, no, I understand. woe effect. No. Maybe I... they use they use. No. I understand. I mean, it, 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 it's again. I'm not a military person, but I sort of do follow sort of more logistics and production side of things because that's my background, I should say. And I did get the impression that the Russians were very, very slow to get drones uh, um, produced in large numbers um, because there were all kinds of industrial tangles and arguments and things of this kind. What do you make of this story? Because it's another one I've seen that the Russians are very slow with their targeting. That, um, uh, and I, I've just read a piece about this Ukrainian raising of the flag on Snake Island, that it would have been actually that these, that the, the Russians observed the Ukrainian troops landing on Snake Island and raising the flag, 
but that by the time the information got to the Rus Russian, you know, strike forces to launch their strike on these uh, um, on these soldiers, um, lots of time had passed. By that time, you know, the effectiveness of a strike on these soldiers, on these Ukrainian soldiers, had had passed, and that this is a problem that the Russians have that they haven't yet got that extreme speed of response that the Americans have developed in terms of getting the information, passing it on to their artillery, their aircraft people, launching the strike immediately. Is, is this something that you also feel is the case? As I see, the Russians are trying to check every single target and yeah. they spend a lot of time doing this. They need to, uh, they don't want to waste their rockets uh as they can do to just to launch them everywhere they think first mm -hmm. of all they want to reduce uh um, casualties among civilians so mm -hmm. that's why they need to check every single yeah. target yeah they first furthermore they need to try to not to waste uh these rockets they need to use them because uh as i understand they don't have any problems with production of this rocket but if they use them mm, in more big number than, than use them right now, maybe they're going to have yeah. some problems with production as well. So yeah. they need to be very careful. So nice. that's why maybe so that's why maybe they uh, have some luck because uh, there was some information that there is soldiers on the Snake Island, but then this information should be checked by few yeah. like departments, and after that there was just a, a strike on this island. They they yeah. try to count, wait if uh, they mm. need to do this, if it um, give them so much benefits and so on. I can just ask a question about Snake Island. I mean, what is its importance? Because I, I again, I talk as a complete non-military person. I, I can't understand why Snake Island has attracted the enormous amount of attention that it has. I mean, it's some distance from Odessa. It doesn't seem to me that it's playing any role in any blockade of Odessa. You can't install large numbers of missiles on it because it's very small place. You can't build a big radar station, as far as I can see, because, again, it's a very small place. And, of course, it's um, difficult to keep supplied. You can't store vast amount of ammunition or keep many troops there. So what is this importance about Snake Island? Why did the Russians capture it at the start of the war? Why were the Ukrainians so keen on uh, at least driving the Russians off it? I mean, is it a symbol? Is it a is it a symbolic of place or is it that I'm missing something that I don't understand something about it, which uh, a, a military person, somebody who understands military affairs can see? If we're talking about Snake Island, uh, at this point of special operation, it's just a media victory, just a symbol. Yeah. But if we're talking about this island when there was Moscow, you remember this ship Moscow that was sunk yeah. there? Yes, with the combination with this ship, it's a very powerful stronghold. And mm -hmm. uh, these uh, strongholds are able to cut any uh, sea trade uh, right. uh, with, with Odessa. So that's why yeah. with this uh, ship, this is a very powerful area to protect. But without this ship, it's just a symbol. Yeah, so the, 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 Russians, the Russians were the trying to reinforce this island to build something uh, that can... Um, some anti-air systems, anti-rocket systems, but mm. it didn't it work was, out. It didn't work out. I mean, so the loss of the Moscow was actually a big blow for the Russians. Yes, it was a very big blow for the Russians. Uh, yeah, thank okay. you. And we still haven't had... Dima, a... I... I uh, yeah. Oh, sorry. Uh, uh, no, Dima, no, no, I want to ask you the following. You know, to, st to step back a little bit from the whole situation so far, I wanted to ask you, you've been monitoring the situation since pretty much the start of this uh, special military operation. And so I wanted to ask you, what uh, changes have you noticed in the Russians in so far as their their adaption, uh, uh, um, adapting to the conditions on the on the ground? What do you think is the biggest change that they have done that has improved their effectiveness? And what do you think is the um, tactic or, or or paradigm that they're carrying out that is not that they should fix that they should adapt to but they still haven't uh if we i remember the march post about the, from other military russian experts it's those who like to critique uh the russian forces and so on 
uh, they are Russians, but they like to uh, say something bad about the Russians. And uh, uh, I remember those March posts, and everybody said that during the first phase, uh, the phase one, there was a battle for Kiev, uh, the Ukrainians had very nice artillery. Uh, they, uh, and if we compare the artillery um, duels between the Russians and the Ukrainians in the first phase of this military special operation, uh, everybody says that the Ukrainians were much successful than the Russians. And uh, the Russians adopted and starting from the April, they um, reduced till zero the entire Ukrainian artillery. And that's why they are so successful. Yes, they're very slow, but they're very successful because there is no artillery against them. Mm -hmm. uh, if we are talking about the current situation, there is mm -hmm. towns like Krasnopolye, um, Bagradishna, Dalina, these towns on the north from Slyansk. And during these two days, the previous two days, there was endless artillery shelling. Mm -hmm. The people from this area uh, wrote like some small text from this area. They say that after when two, these two days passed, they uh, they were very far from this area, but they smell the taste of human meat mm -hmm. because there were so many Ukrainians on those forests. They were so very shelled by every type of Russian artillery, mm -hmm. like 152 millimeters with the mm -hmm. uh, flamethrower systems, uh, with anything they have. And so, and the Ukrainians mm -hmm. are, aren't able to do something against this. So this is the most important like achievement that the Russians managed to achieve during this uh, special military operation. Mm -hmm. And what do the Russians need to improve? Uh, there are one thing, but this thing is not related to maybe even military things, military situation. Of mm -hmm. course, drones system, they need to bring more drones from the uh, Iran, of course, it's obviously. But the thing is that a lot of people are saying that there is a lot of problems among civilians. You see that Ukrainians started to terrorize the territories on the, in the, that under the Russian control. They uh, managed to kill uh, a number of, uh, of local authorities who decided mm. to work with the Russians. And mm. this is a very big problem. Furthermore, not everybody uh, gets salary. I'm talking about the old people who receive pensia. I know this. Mm. When they are retired, they need to get some money from the government mm. authorities. Mm. So this problem is not solved. So they mm. um, they need to improve this. Mm. They need to make people mm. in love with them. So to mm. love them, for locals. And it will solve everything. Because if they have support from the locals, uh, there is no army in the world who will be able to force these locals to fight against the Russians. But there are still yeah. problems with the locals, with guerrilla forces. There are a lot of guerrillas on the territory of Ukraine uh, and the territory that's under the Russian control. And to fix them, yeah. it will give them significant success. Yeah. What do you think of the tactics that the Russians are using in Donbass? Because it seems to me, now again, this is my own untutored sense, that... There's an enormous amount of artillery use, as you correctly said. And by the way, can I just say artillery use? Sorry about my dog. My dog gets joins us in many videos and there's nothing I can do about him. But can I just say um, I'm, I'm, I met people in the 1970s in Britain who'd experienced artillery barrages during the First World War, who'd been hit by German artillery. And they would still have what we called uh, shell shock. They would still have psychological problems left over from that. And I get the sense that the artillery barrages today in Ukraine are actually denser than they were in parts of the Western Front in the First World War. But my impression is they use artillery. They shape the battlefield. Then only after they've managed to soften up the... Ukrainian units and you did a really fascinating program last night by the way which I was watching uh, uh, in which you talked about how Ukrainian units get degraded then they sort of take settlements around the big places that they're trying to capture then only then do they move their infantry into battle am i summarizing this correctly and do you think this is a good tactic to use because i mean it's very incremental and methodical but it's also slow and i know that there's criticisms of how slow it is do, do you am i first of all summarizing it correctly and do you think this is the correct approach in Donbass? yes 
yes, this great approach because uh, the Ukrainians they do have big army. We can say they do have a lot of infantry, and of mm. course, to uh, storm them in front is a very bad idea. Yeah. And the best solution for them, for the Russians, of course, first to reduce the professional forces. Uh, we discussed, like in my previous videos, that uh, first the Russians um, reduced 72nd mechanized brigade, mm. then they uh, reduced uh, artillery 25th, then uh, airborne brigade. And this morning, um, yesterday, they uh, reduced some headquarters of 58th motorized brigade. And I, my projection was that starting this morning, they will try to reduce this brigade as well. But this morning, the Russian military authorities announced that they changed their uh, hunting target. And this morning, they reduced uh, the 13th mechanized brigade that is located um, in the Uglidarska power plant. So what are they doing? Uh, there is a very big uh, spy network there, as far as I understand. They see everything. They see uh, the rotation forces, where they rotate, where they're resting, uh, where their buildings are living. So they find one brigade, and then they start reducing this as much as possible, trying to reduce their morale, and they're willing to continue the fightings. And um, during this week, as I see uh, from the sources and uh, the Ukraine have in this area, about 60% of brigade brigades in this area that protects Bakhmut Sever's area were impacted by the Russians. Mm -hmm. And they have losses from 30 to 80% of their uh, of their number. So that's a lot. So that means that very soon we are going to see offensive operation and that the Russian will just enter as they did in Lysychansk agglomeration when they reduced first some forces and during the rotation period they just pushed and the entire front line collapsed from the Ukrainian side. So the same thing we are going to see in this area as well. I have to say um, some years ago I remember discussing uh, the kind of losses a military unit could take with a British officer and he said that if a unit lost had experienced 5% losses in the British military, it was considered no longer fit for combat and would be taken out of the battle line. And we're talking about 60 to 80% losses in Ukrainian military units. I mean, this is, this is devastating to a Western mind. This is beyond, this is beyond horrifying. I mean, I, I cannot imagine a, a Western army withstanding this kind of pressure. And if we're talking about 60-80%, we need to understand that this number, that means that uh, only officers survive. <laughs> so those one who wasn't on the battlefield yeah. survived. Yeah. So it's yeah. like 5%, 10% of these forces. It's like officers, yeah. cooks, uh, maybe some um i don't know some helpers who are running with the some things mm -hmm. i don't know and 80 percent is the infantry and the equipment yeah i mean it, it, hey, it's dima i it's, i, I, I mean, mm, go on go on Gizar, Gizar. Oh, oh no uh, yeah D dima i have the following question i i had read somewhere uh that the uh, uh ukraine army is using the nato standard of having its officers in the back in the rear and it's uh, non-commissioned officers and it's soldiers in the front. And that this is the standard NATO doctrine, because the NATO doctrine is that the officers are too valuable to risk on the front lines. And that this is having a very bad effect on Ukrainian morale, because the Ukrainian um, armed forces, like the Russians, they, they feel that they want to see their officer. And in fact, you know, we are hearing stories of Russian generals being killed at the front, which, of course, implies they're on the front line fighting with the soldiers. They're not safely away in some bunker far away. And so I, I have to ask, is this NATO um, uh, uh, policy of having officers in the back, is it hurting the Ukraine's combat effectiveness and morale? I can't tell you, like, I'm not, I wasn't on the battlefield. But of course, sometimes, sometimes when we are talking about close combat, like we saw during the Second World War, like we see right now here, sometimes it's it's very important to see your commander right behind you, and mm. he can give you an example of what to do. 
Mm. Of course, there is a very big risk that this general might be killed. But if this general survives, and I'm sure that a lot of generals from the Russian side survived during these examples, because I'm mm. sure that all of them shown their personal example to their soldiers. Mm. And after that, uh, regular soldiers are no longer able, from morale perspective, to refuse. Because mm. uh, uh, from this point of view, if we're talking about the Russian standard, the Russian soldier see that his general can stand right in front of him, behind him, like back, right in back with him, and mm. to attack together. Mm. And we're talking about the Ukrainians. Sometimes there is no power. Uh, sometimes there is no power to rise the soldiers. And this is the reason why the Ukrainians are using anti-retreat forces. So we can say that mm. if we're talking about the Russians, they try to motivate soldiers with example from the uh, from the higher commanders. So we are higher commanders. We're showing you an example. So you can do the same. And they do the same. And if we're talking about the Ukrainians, they use anti-retreat forces. And mm. this is not an example. This forcing the Ukrainians to fight, to be, to mm. die, maybe not even to fight. Yeah. Can you yeah, tell so us a little bit? The anti-retreat forces, uh, uh, sorry, the anti-retreat forces are basically there to scare the soldiers into fighting. And that's what you're saying. And, and they're not allowing them to retreat. There was a lot of, I'm not saying that it's like massively, I'm not saying about the massive effect, but there were a lot of examples, and I want to point that all these examples are coming from the Russian sources, uh, that uh, Ukrainians are saying, the regular soldiers are saying that uh, those anti-retreat forces sometimes kills civilians, kill uh, soldiers who want to retreat, to run, to stop fighting, and so on. Mm. And uh, one of the most, the freshest example about the situation is the situation about Mariupol. Mm. Uh, you know that there was like Azov Battalion there in Mariupol, and there was uh, uh, um, Valina, as I remember. There was a commander from the regular Ukrainian forces, and he was captured by the Russians, and he gave an interview. And he told everything. Maybe, of course, he's like under Russian investigation, the territory of Russian Federation, mm -hmm. and he and he can say everything they want. It's we understand this, but he said what he said, and he said that there is a very bad uh, attitude from the national forces, anti-retreat forces towards the regular army, and that they are mm -hmm. really afraid of them, and they can't do anything with them. So mm -hmm. it's his words. To believe or not, I think that it's uh, everybody should decide for himself. Right. Right. Well, I think we've been speaking for an hour and I'm conscious that you have a huge amount of work to do. I mean, I, the amount of time it must take you to collate all this information, at Dima, and to provide updates every day is just astonishing. And I will say for, for me, it's absolutely essential because as somebody who doesn't understand war, being able to switch on and follow and understand a little bit of what's going on. So um, before I finish, just to ask, Gonzalo, do you have any further questions to ask Dima? And then perhaps, Dima, if you can just give us a few concluding words. And then also, please provide us with information, our viewers, of where they can find you, where your channel is, where they can go, where they can see all the information that you provide every day, uh, regular as a clock, <laughs> um, um, providing us with these extraordinary updates of the battle in Donbass and elsewhere in Ukraine. I think we've just lost Gonzalo. Am I, are you there, Gonzalo? Gonzalo? <laughs> Gonzalo? Um, just asking you, uh, do you have any sort of concluding questions or comments on this? Hello? I think we seem to be missing him well perhaps if you can just if you could step in Dima because he's obviously having a bad connection um right I have sent like uh, my link to my channel yeah uh, I know we've we've, we've we've seen it thanks um, uh, any, any concluding thoughts about where this war is going and and what what do you think my wish my wish that this war ends before the end of this live stream this is my <laughs> wish. I, I Every morning I wake up and I ask God to stop this war as fast as possible. Yeah. Because uh, that's it's very bad. It's very terrible. These people, um, Ukrainians and the Russians, they are not like aliens. We are on the same, we are living on the same planet. We are living at the same home. We need to 
build buildings, we need to make movies, we need to sing songs, but we shouldn't kill each other because it's very bad. It's very bad. And I think that Zelensky should um, un stop war from his side. Putin should stop from his side. They need to start negotiation and it will be the best for everybody. Mm. So, so something like this. Thank so you. Thank you good. one more time for uh, Alexander for, uh, to, for uh, kind of for joining me in this event. Thank you very much. I'm very fan of you. One more time, I repeat myself. Thank you, Gonzalo, for uh, for your Indeed. help because uh, Gonzalo, and, 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 Gonzalo arranged this program. Are you are you with us, Gonzalo? Do you just what, have you yeah. have you time to say a few things just just before we sign off? Uh, yeah, unfortunately, I had just, I had some sort of technical issue. I dropped yeah. off, but uh, yeah, I I'm, it was a pleasure having uh, you know talking with Dima once again, and uh, I'm so glad that. Uh, that he's appeared on the Duran, and I hope that this becomes like a regular feature because uh, mm -hmm. I think that his, uh, his, his, his the name of his channel says it all: military summary. I think it's outstanding. And he's Dima, outstanding. Tell well, people you read my mind. <laughs> tell people we hope so. We hope we hope so too. We also add to your feelings that we long for this war to end as soon as possible. I mean, we take absolutely no joy in reporting it i mean it's it's been a very very difficult thing for all of us to uh, um to report about and to hear about and as i said i mean i i've never experienced war but i've experienced political violence in my youth in my childhood in greece and i have to say it's a, it's a terrible thing to see so uh dima military summary channel uh, you can find it we're going to provide you with the link and Everybody who wants to understand from day to day what's going on, who also wants to get through all the fog of war that the media provides, because one of the most depressing things is one reads everyday stories in the media, which to my mind are more like uh, fiction, um, adventure stories, action movie stuff in some parts of the media, which I, I mean, make me angry, actually. But if you want to just get past all of that, Dima's channel military summary channel is the place to go so with that i'm going to say thank you dima for joining us it's been a huge honor it's been a huge pleasure thank you gonzalo for bringing us all together on this channel and uh, that's been a wonderful program and gonzalo your contributions always are invaluable thank, thank you so much, much.